subconscious um, in Jerry's memory, uh, because Wagner, we come back again and again in Wagner to what Richard Ruskin has called the restored pre-modern harmony uh, that his operas depict, a harmony between man and nature, between work and play or art. Work and music are at one with each other. To put it even more strongly, Wagner's is a vision of music as intrinsic to the very act of living in the world. Uh, this itself makes him, uh, you can conjure with that for a little bit, um, this makes him a very active participant in an intriguing trend in the 19th century in musical culture uh, as well as more generally, and that is um, what you were referring to uh, in introducing this, this gathering discussion of the relationship between music and society, uh, which is one aspect of the proliferation of new venues in which the sciences, social and natural sciences, uh, and music intersected. It's the moment when the German professoriate discovered music as an object of scientific study, not as the ancients and early moderns had discovered it in terms of math and cosmic speculation, but as a matter of biology or of sociology or of any number of the emerging social sciences. And particularly in the latter part of the 19th century, we find this conversation about music and work um, developing and featuring uh, in the work of a number of scholars. Now, this is remarkable because one of the most enduring cliches concerning the 19th century, voiced by Nietzsche when he referred to music sarcastically as a telephone from the beyond, is that people regarded it as a thing apart, almost sacred. The reality, though, was that music was very corporeal. Music was very involved in everyday life and functioned uh, very much in the world of work. Uh, and so this phenomenon, its context and its consequences, I offer in a sense as an antidote to the idea of musical transcendence um, and as a kind of enriching of what we think about when we think about musical culture uh, in the 19th and 20th centuries both. Now, I want to put this briefly in the context of how people wrote about music in earlier centuries, and hence this slide, which is from Athenaeus Kircher's Musorgia Universalis of 1650. Uh, an important, before we get to that, uh, I wanted to say that an important strand of writing about music before this period, uh, one that was passed down through a variety of means from Greco-Roman thinkers, associated music especially with ritual and play. Johann Boisinga, our most genial guide to the play element in culture, notes that the semantic understanding of manipulating musical instruments is play in a whole variety of languages, Germanic, Romance, Slavonic, Arabic. And he speculates that there must be some deep-rooted psychological reason for so remarkable a symbol of the affinity between music and play. He cites the ancients as evidence. Plato in his laws, telling us that Apollo gave this race of men born to sorrow, the gift of the muses, to be a respite from labor and sorrow, but he also gave them rhythm and harmony, so as to bring order into the disorder of play. Aristotle, informing us that the nature of music was not easy to determine, but probably exists for the sake of play and recreation. We desire it, he said, as we desire sleep and drink, which are likewise neither important in themselves nor serious, but pleasant and potent to distill care. Both did think that there was something ethical about music, something conducing to virtue that might be useful for education, and a great deal of writing about music followed upon these observations, most of it theological or mathematical theological, and expanding in quantity and scope after the 16th century, both among Protestants and Catholics in the West. The element of play retreated, replaced by more ethical and religious concerns. Classical authors thus bequeathed to Europeans two intertwined traditions and types of musical knowledge. The first is the one that is uh, embodied in this. It's a metaphysical and scientific one. Uh, it is the one that is associated with this most enduring myth of the West, the harmony of the spheres, um, which is also a myth held in other traditions as well. But this is clearly one that's about, um, about uh, in the West. And you, this myth goes back to Pythagoras, who founded, who decided or figured out that there were these mathematical relations among tones that sounded good together. 
And you see in Tiershirt's um, illustrations, there's Pythagoras um, hearing the sound of smithies working away at the smith. And allegedly, this is a potent myth itself. Pythagoras never actually probably heard that. Um, but thought that, wow, they all sound good together. I point this out again because I come back to blacksmiths again later in the talk. Um, that's one of the traditions of musical knowledge. It's metaphysical. It has to do with cosmic harmony. And the second one is a rhetorical and ethical tradition, which concerns the nature of communication, influence, persuasion, uh, which recruits music to something like oratory, uh, in which it expresses, it rouses, it directs the emotions. Crossing each other, combining, elaborating these ideas about what music was and from whence it came, flourished in the 18th century Republican of letters and came to some kind of a synthesis in the work of the Romantics. Their notions of music's role in emotional fulfillment and heavenly transcendence left behind the mimetics of, of oratory while keeping the emotions. And at the same time, they resounded the trope of the harmony of the spheres, uh, this time without man. As many scholars have observed, uh, the institutional coming to embodiment of the romantic understanding of music became the concert hall. And at the same time, the notion of music representing something that had nothing at all to do with work, that was perhaps inimical to work, persisted, and in the age of industry, further hardened as factory owners for bad spinners from whistling while at work, and at what one social historian has called the great split between work and leisure became seemingly unbridgeable with music on the other side. Music was very much on the side of leisure. It was associated with fun and fulfillment, and as such, it was considered something of a critique of work. So play, cosmic harmony, emotional expression. Uh, these are broad generalizations, but I've made them in order to suggest that while a very long and highly nuanced discussion of music existed by the beginning of the 19th century, it had not highlighted or made theoretically important or explicitly discovered or discussed any compatibility between music and work. Consider Herder. His 1773 polemic concerning Ossian's poetry called for the educated Germans to pay attention to the music and poetry all around them in the form of quoting them folk songs, provincial songs, and peasant songs, sounding in streets and alleys and fish markets, among peasants and beggars and artisans. But more interested in music's relation to language and religion, Herder did not pursue the relationship of these songs of work to the circumstances of their creation and sounding. But luckily, this is not where the story ends. I want to spend the rest of the talk showing how the arrival of industrial modernity, that which Wagner criticized and sought to reform, brought into play a new kind of engagement with music uh, within scientific and social scientific disciplines and within the factories themselves. And at the simplest level, my argument is that this new kind of engagement with music is as important to our understanding of musical culture um, as our concert halls and opera houses and those who wrote about what went on in them, which is bulk of what uh, musicology has studied. Uh, it's historians of science and technology who have taken the lead in expanding our sense of musical culture in this way. And the key figure in this literature is Hermann Hemholtz, the author of The Sensation of Tones. Um, there's a whole series of books on him at this point, which I uh, would be happy to tell you the titles of if you're interested. But my concern today is less with the ear, which is Hamhall's concern, hearing, uh, with acoustics, physiology, and aesthetics, than it is with the whole body, and thus with those emerging forms of scholarly discourse that fall under the capricious and capacious umbrella of social science. And so I'd like to introduce you, finally, to this man that you're staring at here, someone who I know some of you have met already, uh, and that is the political economist, statistician, and economic historian Karl Brücher. He's getting a lot more attention these days. A modern biography of him came out in 2011. Uh, anthropologists are paying a lot of attention to him as well. 
uh, but um, given that he's less well known perhaps than some of his contemporaries, and probably might be so, um, I'm going to spend a little time on his um, biography and his book. In 1896, at age 49, he published a book called Arbeit und Rhythmus, Work and Rhythm. It is a book about the birth of music from the experience of work, and it constituted the first thoroughgoing, wide-ranging effort to link together these two very basic bodily functions, laboring and making music. Bücher was born in 1847 in a village in the Taunus, just about 30 kilometers north of Wiesbaden. He died in 1930 in Leipzig, a man whose lifespan encompassed Hobsbawm's age of industry and empire, and even extended uh, into the age of extremes. His background was artisanal and rural. His father was a brush maker, his mother was the daughter of a baker. He went to gymnasium. It's very much the profile of a bright young man um, who some priest recognizes as being bright. So he was sent to gymnasium. From there, he went to the universities of Bonn and Göttingen, where he studied ancient history and philology. He got his dissertation done in 1970, didn't win laurels, uh, but got a degree and went on to work in gymnasia in Dortmund and Frankfurt on Main. It's in Frankfurt that he found his calling. He awoke, as it were, from his rural and classical slumbers, and in, in the words of his obituary writer and friend, Gerd Broadwit, uh, he became engaged with the questions of the day, with the political and economic contrasts and antitheses of Bismarck's Germany, its greatness and its harshness, and he became, again in Broadwit's words, a Kämpfer, a fighter. He began writing articles for Leopold Sonnemann's Liberal Democratic Frankfurt Zeitung on social and economic issues, and soon became the paper's editor for these things. In this capacity, he came in contact and joined the Verein für Sozialpolitik, Social Policy Association, a densely networked organization of socially engaged academics and social political reformers. Here I have to look at somebody else for a while. This is a, one of those composite portraits of all of them. In. Here, top. You can hardly read who they all are, but you can enjoy yourself trying to figure it out. Uh, in this milieu, Bücher established himself as a younger member of the historical school of political economy. He began writing socio historical scholarly studies that drew on his training in ancient history, now wedded to a concern for the origins of the present conditions and crises. He did a study of unfree labor in the second and third centuries. He translated work of Belgian economists and added tons of tractors on how it looked in, it, in Germany. And he wrote an enormous work on medieval population statistics in Frankfurt on Main. This last was subsequently accepted um, as a Habilitationsschrift at the University of Munich, where he lived for a while and married, um, very definitely married up. Uh, to Emily Mittermeier, who is the daughter of, very much the daughter of the Bildungsberger to she practically grown up in a small palace in Heidelberg, um, much different than his background. She brought him uh, entree into, very clearly entree into the, the kind of social circles that his intelligence was taking him into at the same time. By the 1880s, with publications and degrees, and a reputation as a coming man in the historical school of political economy, uh, Bücher began his academic career in earnest. This took him first to the German University in Dorpat, uh, Tartu in present-day Estonia. I mentioned this as uh, he paid attention to what was going on there. Then he went to Basel and Karlsruhe, and in 1892, he was called to the University of Leipzig, of Leipzig as uh, the chair of economics. He worked in this prestigious position, a colleague of Wilhelm Bund, Friedrich Ratzel, Karl Lambrecht, until his retirement in 1917, at which point he had lots of life left. He didn't die until 1930. He got into um, creating the first school of journalism in Germany and other things like that. His life period was his most fruitful. His first influential work, the cover of it, published in 1892, 
translated into English in 1901, this industrial evolution, and went through 17 editions of Germany, translated and lots of other things. Uh, it was widely read. It proposed three stages of economic development uh, from ancient times. Uh, it was controversial enough that it had its own Streit, the Bücher Meyer Streit. Um, and its impact was such that by the time Arbeit und Rhythmus came out four years later in 1896, reviewers referred to it as the work of an economist of high renown, a learned professor at Leipzig, the author of brilliant essays on the origin of economic life. Work and rhythm was in the first instance a study of the nature of work. Inspired by his earlier investigations into cooperative modes of work and informed by his wide readings in travel literature and ethnography, in psychology and physiology, we see very much the influence of Wilhelm Wundt in this, uh, Musikwissenschaft, uh, and not least in his original field of classical and ancient history. As he explained, although work is the starting point for forming all economic phenomena, Nevertheless, a thorough investigation of its essential character, its basin, by political economists has till now seldom been undertaken. We treat it, he said, as something unique unto itself, distinct from any other kind of human activity, such as play or exercise. Um, we, as econ econ economists, <laughs> have only really devoted ourselves, he said, to studying why, how it is organized, but why have we never looked at what it actually is, physiologically and mentally? How it is undertaken by actual human beings with minds filled with associations and with nervous systems easily affected by their environment. there. So he began by analyzing the actual physical motions, the Körperbewegungen, involved in such activities as threshing, grinding grain, breaking turf, pushing, pulling, and lifting all manner of heavy things, such as sails, logs, rocks, animals. It's, very, it's very grounded work. It's filled with these kinds of lists of things that people do with their bodies. And from this physical foundation, he built an argument that not only reasserted the argument of the previous book, specifically in regards to the division of labor, but also accounted for the whole world of cultural production as well. And this unlikely edifice was built on the element that was the second term of his title, rhythm. For him, it was a matter of our animal nature, our physical being. He writes, the activity of the lungs and heart, the motions of our legs and arms when we walk, are in normal circumstances rhythmic. The trotting horse and the loaded camel are alike, the boatman rowing or the blacksmith hammering. Rhythm regulates energy needs, it makes possible the division of labor, it is the lubrication, the machine oil, he calls it, of the human body. It mitigates the weariness of the muscles, it awakens pleasurable feelings, that's important too, and it frees the mind for creative thought. In the most simple forms of economic activity, bodily labor to feed or shelter oneself and others, or none at all, um, or aided by uh, no tools at all, rhythm was intrinsic to the successful completion of physically demanding, ruling, tedious physical labor. That was his argument. Work is hard, and rhythm helps it go by. The more protracted the labor, the more rhythmical it tends to become. And he says this applies not just to individual labor, like blacksmiths or carpenters or threshers or Hans Sachs, but to collective, aggregated labor. So I'm going to give you a, a little more taste of his style with uh, a few different things for you to, to look at. This is a 1908 painting of Russian villagers. Um, he distinguished, for instance, between individual labor and the aggregated labor he called the um, Ketong, or concatenation of labor. Um, people working independently, side by side, for the speedy disposition of the task. They dig and mill and mow and spin and weave. They pluck these feathers. Here they're working together. And rhythm, rhythmical movement links each one taking part in the work to his neighbor through the succession of his movements, combining all by means of the tempo into unity of system, making it an automatically working organism. He's big on this automatism of it. Um, another kind of labor, 
uh, illustrated by this one of Smith's hammering, um, involves alternate tempos. Smith's hammering, Whitman talking a tree, maids beating carpets, sailors hoisting a sail. This is in Knopscott Bay in the early 20th century. Um, all of these could be done alone, but they would be more wearisome uh, and less rhythmic. The last kind of labor aggregation he talks about is joint labor, the simultaneous cooperation of various kinds of labor supplementing one another. And here I have a series of things. I'd like to read you his list of aggregate labor um, because it's rather like a poem and it makes some startling, this has a kind of crescendo quality, making for some startling juxtapositions. Smith and Bellows man, rope maker and man turning the wheel, mason and hod carrier, those placing and those pounding in the paving stones, hunters and feeders, <laughs> musician and dancer, blower and organist, drummers and pipers, judge, bailiffs and clerk, doctor and attendants, a theatrical troupe and orchestra. So how do we get so seemingly effortlessly from the Smith and Bellows man to the orchestra? was, after all, an aggregation of workers uh, that only came into its own at the end of the 18th century. I put up the Tameside factory brass band there instead of an orchestra. Just so you know, I realize that's not an orchestra. Um, all of this, this astonishing sort of sentence that I read to you, um, simply builds on his ideas about the physical toil of labor. It's more cooperation and labor evolved, more different tasks coordinated with each other, and the more different work rhythms needed to match with each other, and the naturally evolving response to this challenge was music. Bucher hypothesized that at first it was just sounds, percussive sounds, shouts, kind of noises, uh, and sometimes maybe accompanied by something like drums or flutes. But his larger conclusion was that in the beginning of humanity, primitive, primitive people figured out that music, sounds made by voices, could enhance the rhythmic character of manual labor and make it more nearly automatic, less fatiguing, and beyond even those benefits, music would arouse pleasurable feelings and make you want to work harder. Mm -hmm. Bucher came to this conclusion by an extraordinarily bold process of kind of reverse reasoning, intuitive, inductive reasoning, that began with the phenomenon of the work song. These he had been collecting since childhood in the Talmuds and continued to gather as he moved from place to place as an adult. He had, for, for example, a small treasure trove of Estonian, Latvian, and Lithuanian folk songs that dated back to his days in Dorpat. And in working on the book, he vastly expanded his collection of work songs by the extensive reading I mentioned earlier. The first edition of the book included some four score, some 80 of these work songs, subsequent editions added even more. By the third edition, 1902, there were 269 work songs in the book, and he would add more in subsequent editions as more people sent him further examples. It came a kind of, um, I think this would call it a crowdsourcing thing. Everyone um, read the book and sent him their favorite work songs. Uh, and these songs came from all over the world and across time. They provided witness to almost 2,000 years of laboring, from ancient Egypt to modern Germany, from Native Americans to Estonian peasants to Japanese fishermen, from, um, from um, free to bonded to slave labor in fields and forests, homes and workshops at sea, on rivers, and on land. Uh, this is a um, work song from New Zealand. Um, and he, 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 this I just show you this uh, so you see how he does it. He, he has a kind of transcription that he's gotten from somewhere or other of what the New Zealand native peoples are saying. And then he translated it into, translates it into Germany, but he wants you to see that these are, these are kind of um, quasi words. They're sort of words that are rhythmic and, uh, and that's really how he figured all of this out. That's how he deduced that they were, um, that they were rhythms that went, that derived from the music. Uh, from the work. Um, and this one is from the Lower Rhine, um, and it's flax, it's a flax uh, root digger's song. <laughs> you know, to, I had to look up how flax is 
raise, um, the hardest part of, of raising flax and making linen is actually digging the roots out. So this is all about um, root digging, work that was mostly done by men. Uh, Luther organized this abundance by the labor they accompany. So that's, I mean, that's why it's a book about labor. It's all about, th this is what spinners sing. This is what flax workers sing. This is what um, rowers sing, and so on. Um, and within that, he also categorizes it by the, you know, by the um, point in the work. This is what you sing when you're pulling the sail. This is what you sing when you're rowing, and so on. Uh, the point in all of it was that the music didn't shape the work. Its rhythms uh, were following those of the work. Uh, moreover, work and rhythm and the music that emerged from them were universals. No group of people was more musical or more hardworking than any other. These are all sort of engaging with the kind of uh, dialogue with early ethnography. He says, he says that women work as hard, probably harder than men, and probably produced more of the music and poetry than had men originally. There's a real feminist argument here that I don't have time to talk about, but he more or less says at one point that women are the inventors of poetry, so there. <laughs> okay. Uh, Bucher's subject was always humanity, and his discipline was, when all was said and done, economics. But the evolutionary story he told was not unlike that depicted by, in many ways, Richard Wagner. In the beginning, there was work, play, music, and poetry. They were all of a piece, not activities shut off one from another. Think of the Rhine maidens uh, playing with the gold, or probably um, better to think of the Norns singing and weaving the fate of the world. Or listen to Bücher in a strangely Norn-like mode, telling of how his researches had uncovered, quoting now, a series of threads, the ends of which are widely separated in this modern world, but the beginnings of these threads come nearer together the farther back we follow them, and finally come together in one point. This point lies close to the boundary of the region where pathless darkness enshrouds the earliest history of mankind. And if we follow with our mind's eye the ways traversed through the centuries, we then recognize that we are dealing with a process of social evolution, process of integration and differentiation, of unity to a division of labor. In this pathless darkness, song was called forth from the rhythms of work. So from the, the division of labor also produces the eventual separation of music and poetry from work, which allowed them to become art and be cultivated and enjoyed as such. Musicians and dancers and their close associates priests, shamans, theologians, and philosophers were in some sense the first to break off and form a separate group in the great history of the division of labor. The origins and development, mind you, of harmony and melody follow from all of that, um, and the analysis of these that had been so crucial to the characterization of musical discourse since the ancients um, are all for Bucher a kind of secondary development, so much cultural noise it doesn't really interest him. I mean, he, he's, he's interested in rhythm. He's interested in how all of this stuff fit together in a kind of corporeal way, not just <coughs> fancy notes on the page. Moreover, Luger is investigating the past in order to understand the present, and looking back at the condition of laboring human bodies in his own time, um, compared to those in previous times, he thought that something essential had been driven out of the experience of working. Because of mechanized industry and a market economy in which only a few people have the means of production, what had once been a world in which men and women labored together, the rhythms of their body determining the pace of their work, had become something quite different. We had become alienated from our own rhythmic selves. Uh, and thus, rhythm and song were no longer an aid to labor, nor was the mind freed by rhythmic labor to roam freely. Uh, which again, is what was the key to human creativity in his mind. Rhythmic work, he wrote, is in no sense soulless or mindless. It is rather to the greatest degree spiritualized, vergeistigt, Arbeit. It is in every way a powerful, <coughs> cultural promoting form in the evolution of civilizations. And so in the final pages of his book, uh, he, he wrote a, a lament which uh, sounds faintly like Max Weber's 
about how the old music of work was replaced by worrying, deafening noise, its rhythmic character unrecognizable, its effect only unpleasant and exhausting. In our advanced societies, all the elements that bound people together, that bound together art and technology and their physical existence, were taking separate paths of development. And here, again, some lengthy quote of him, therein is the life of an individual made poorer, more dry and unemotional. Work is no more at one with music and poetry. Production for the market no longer brings honor and renown to the workman. And the same is true for artists. One's work activities are no longer cheerful play and merry pleasure, but serious duty and often painful renunciation. Sure, our work is more productive, our artistic experiences are arguably richer and more plentiful, though I hope you really thought that. Um, still, he concluded, we must not give up the hope that it could be possible to bring together technology and art into a higher rhythmic unity, which would once again give to the spirit a sense of fleeting cheer and to the body of harmonious formation, which we can see in the best that has come down to us from early mankind. I want to turn now to uh, his reception, um, because it is this final hope that resonated in the scholarly and cultural milieu that surrounded him. Now certainly Bücher is not the only one talking about rhythm at this time, and so that is one aspect of his reception. Um, rhythm, you can almost argue, is a kind of key word at the end of the 19th century. Uh, it's not clear how much of it Bücher was aware of or read, but probably a lot because he seems to be uh, read everything. For instance, in um, 1894, a man named Thaddeus Bolton in uh, the United States wrote a 95-page article in the American Journal of Psychology on rhythm, which is called Rhythm. Um, it would require some detective work to show that Bücher had seen it, but there is a connection via the Hans Luntz, it's a bit obscure. Uh, there was also a um, and an early ethnomusicologist named Richard Wallachek, uh, Austrian, who's working in the British Library uh, on primitive cultures. He too, um, in his book on the origins of music among savage peoples, uh, wrote about rhythm. But the rhythm that he was interested in had no connection to work. It was all about communal singing and dancing. It was kind of psychophysical rather than uh, economically emphasized. In any case, Bucher's book, uh, was far more successful than any of these. Uh, I have to show this slide again, because I, I don't know if you noticed, but this is an edition that was in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Um, it, I referred already to this, uh, some of its editions. I'll just list them for you. It went into um, five more editions, each time substantially bigger, 1899, 1902, 1909. And that one, he says in the preface, I'm done with this. I never wanted to see this stuff again, more or less. Uh, but then again, it came out again in 1919 and 1924. So in effect, he was never free of this book. It was translated once into Russian and once again into English in the 1930s in a much reduced form uh, by the Music Education Division of the New York WPA Music Project. And that's a very rare book. I, basically, you can only see it in the Library of Congress and I haven't seen it. Um, essentially, it's not been translated into English, and it would be hard to do, I have to say. Uh, it consolidated his reputation as a scholar of originality and imagination, um, and attracted attention from people well outside of his own field. So I'm going to plunge briefly into the waters of scholarly reception, and then turn to those outside of scholarship. Uh, for instance, in 1911, we find Eric von Hornbostel, one of the founding fathers of ethnomusicology, reviewing it and noting that few monographs of musical science have found so wide a circle of readers, including experts and lay people. Now, it's not really a work of musical science, uh, but it shows that he thought it was. Uh, it's not entirely clear either what experts he was referring to, because this is, as you many of you know, is a era of great disciplinary instability. I mean, productive instability. But there are all kinds of disciplines emerging and crossing and um, cross-pollinating and other things. And Bucher's book is a prime example of this in a way. Among his social science colleagues, reviews were mostly friendly. One intellectual historian of anthropology, in fact, calls him the most important um, theorist in the anthropology of work. 
in, on at which point I want to remind you that he didn't know anything about the early Marx when he was writing about the alienation of labor. Uh, so uh, the anthropology of work owes a lot to both of those Marx and Bücher in ways that we're probably less aware of. But apart um, from Bücher, we cannot really talk about a sustained attention in this period to sociological or economic analysis of the role of music in society. So he's quite distinctive. There's a suggestive essay by Georg Simmel in the 1880s, which people have rediscovered that very happily and said it anticipates Bourdieu's taste communities, but nobody was talking about it that way at the time. Um, and then Max Weber wrote a book, which was published after his death, on the rational and social foundations of music. Uh, it's impressive, virtuosic even, uh, in his ability to harness the development of functional harmony to, uh, to his model of the rationalization of the world. But again, not much read, and I don't think really one can say that it's influential. Where Bucher's book really perked up some scholarly ears was among those participating in what was by the 1890s a lively discussion about the origins of music. Most of it came out of the disciplinary stew of psychology, philosophy, biology, physiology, ethnography, and linguistics. In any case, I'm not going to summarize it, but simply note that for all the people engaged in it, work and rhythm, Arbeit and Rhythmus, had little to no impact on how investigations into the origins of music developed. This is not a case of the dog that didn't bark, an absence of a reception that is in itself very revealing. It is rather a case of the dog that barked, people paid attention, looked into the matter, and concluded that this dog was barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> the most sustained scholarly attention to Bucher's work came from people who we now call ethnomusicologists, but at the time were pursuing investigations into comparative musicology, into sound perception. Um, and they came especially from two people who were in um, the view of the retrospective view of today's ethnomusicologists, members of the Berlin School. These were Karl Strumpf, polymath, cognitive psychologist, phenomenologist, originator of the Gestalt theory, and author of a 1911 book called The Origins of Music, and his student and collaborator, the aforementioned Eric Moritz von Bornbostel. Strumpf's treatise mentioned Arbeit and Rhythmus twice, calling it interesting and substantial, but dismissing out of hand the idea that work songs played any particular role in the great record of music that we have left to us. The more sustained demolition of Bücher was his student Hornbostel's assignment. And that Hornbostel did handily in 10 short pages in the Zeitschrift der Internationalen Musikgesellschaft, so widely read among um, people in these fields, 1911-12 edition. Piece by piece, he criticized Bücher's claims, largely by demonstrating to devastating effect that Bücher didn't know what he was talking about. He failed to understand how the basic components of music worked, meter, melody, harmony, and his work song collections were arbitrary and unscientific and ripped out of the particular context in which they should be studied. Now, I'd like to suggest that this was pretty much the end of the scholarly world's attention to Bucher's book as a work to be taken seriously, that is, in his own time. <laughs> Hornbostel was undoubtedly right in his criticisms. But to understand more fully the nature of this scholarly rejection, uh, we, need to, we need the stage voice of Bruno Nettle, uh, not a founding father, but a kind of pater familias to today's uh, ethnomusicologists, particularly in this country. Neville's written a lot about the history of ethnomusicology and has a, a, a rather sort of sour view of people like Hornbostel, very important, but nevertheless. He sees a distinct profile among the scholars who undertook these first more scientific and disciplined uh, searches into world music uh, at exactly this time. He points out that most of them were children not of musicians as such, but of avid musical amateurs and music lovers. Theirs was a world in which classical music filled one's leisure hours, represented an essential element of what it was to be a member of the Bildungsbürgertum, a cultivated existence. They were sons of scientists and judges and doctors, or in the case of um, Eric Moritz von Hohenbossel, of the cadet branch of a lower Saxon noble family that in the early 19th century 
um, got an Austrian title as well. And young Eric uh, grew up in Vienna in a world of abundant music making. He was a very serious uh, pianist and so on. None, points out Mendel, came from rural or working class backgrounds, as had Bücher. For Nettle, the consequence of such backgrounds on the scholarly work these people produced was their belief that world musics were separate units, stylistically different. None, none of this kind of broad universalism that Luther was, was um, aiming for. More than that, he sees among these early comparativists an attachment to harmony as the real, that's where the real action is for the ethnomusicologists. It's in harmony, the secondary melody, and he writes that there is no doubt in my mind that these early ethnomusicologists wanted to show that non-Western musics were stylistically organized according to harmony and melody in good part because they had learned their own music with this value in mind. Rhythm, he said, was never paid attention to, and therefore Bucher's seminal work was dismissed and forgotten. But outside of musicology and its, um, and its ethnomusicological branch, um, this perception of Bucher was very different. I'd like to spend the rest of the time uh, looking at this. So much of the professors, in other words. <laughs> Two other contexts in which we can take the measure of his place in history. The first is that jumble of fantasy echo movements, practices, and gurus that go under the heading of life reform, or as Kevin Rep has put it, the search for alternate modernities. In the face of it, nothing could be more distant in habitus than the somewhat stodgy, unfashionable Bücher and the Swiss celebrity pedagogue Emile Jacques d'Alcroze, but a direct line connects them via Wolf Dorn, the, one of the key figures in the German Werkbund and in the founding of the garden city Hellerbahn, and an enthusiastic reader of Arbeit und Rhythmus. What Dorn learned from Bücher was that final compelling vision, that hope with which Bücher ended his book, that it could be possible to bring together technology and art into a higher rhythmic unity. In Dalcroix, Dorn found the man who would fulfill this hope. And during the 1890s, teaching in Geneva, Dalcroix had developed a way of learning and experiencing music that was known as rhythmics. It was, it was learning music through bodily motion. I mean, it shared much of the same understanding of, of bodily functions of physical movement as Bucher's in its essentialism, in its originalism. Um, and in, I guess I could call it consequentialism, that it really mattered. Everything follows from it. So uh, in, in the Garden City of Pellerau, they built this uh, Festspiel house, um, which was to house Dalcroze's Eurythmics activities. Here is one of them. Again, there's a, there is also, you'll um, recognize a kind of echo of Wagnerian uh, avant gardeism as well. All of this. Uh, was to build upon the idea that there could be some kind of restoration of rhythm into the lives of modern people. Many other places sprang up in which to teach Dal Croza's method. Um, Dal this thing itself kind of collapses by the end of uh, World War I. Um, but this kind of influence of Arbeit und Rhythmus, of Bücher's book on other kinds of things, gymnastics movements, um, could be I could give you more examples of it, um, but I won't. Um, in any case, that area of things, Bücher was, was uh, kind of custom made for. The rhythm is important, that it's important to get back to nature and move your body and listen to music. Now, a very different kind of reception of this, very different path of influence, also moves from Bücher's final paragraph through the emerging field of industrial psychology to more technocratic and less artistic efforts to reform the sphere of industrial labor itself. Uh, one of the few American, review one of the few American reviewers of it, for instance, pointed out that it shows what the most enlightened manufacturers are doing to produce drudgery and surround the work with pleasant associations. The key figure in this, of taking Bücher to America, is Hugo Munsterberg, pictured here on the steps of Widener Library at Harvard. Uh, he was a student of Wilhelm Wundt, an admirer of the new Bucher, an admirer of Bucher's book. 
and he was brought to Harvard uh, by William James in the 1890s. In Munsterberg's 1913 book, Psychology and Industrial Efficiency, he takes a very Bukharian line in arguing for the possibility of enhancing employees' work experience by making the machine more adapted to the natural bodily and psychological rhythms. But Munsterberg, a kind of uh, literal-minded fellow, also wrote approvingly of efforts he had encountered in the U.S. to bring music into the workplace. Not exactly sailors singing sea shanties, but Munsterberg thought it might have the same effect, especially in factories like cigar factories, he said, where it was kind of quiet and you could actually hear the music. He thought we needed a lot more experimentation on what, how it would affect attention spans, what musical keys were best, what would bring about the best economic results. He also thought that much the same effect could be had as mobilizing workers, bringing greater productivity by having a factory cat. So, do something about how seriously you took all this. Uh, lastly, I'll give you NIP. NIP is the National Institute for Industrial Psychology, founded in Great Britain in 1921 by Charles Myers, almost as so called into being by Munsterberg himself, who suggested that there should be such institutes. And the NIP, the National Institute for Industrial Psychology, published lots of articles in its, um, in its journal about uh, music and work. I'll just read you one of them. It's an article, uh, part of a series on the worker's point of view. And this one is by a printer uh, who used to work at a printing press and uh, had become a researcher. He notes the good effect of whistling and singing during tedious tasks. In his experience, the jobs that require the least mental effort are the ones that induce the most whistling, and that employers should not discourage it because it aids into concentration. And then he really enters into preacher land. Whether or not one is inclined to whistle, he writes, really hinges upon the degree of rhythm attached to the job. There seems to be something in the human makeup which induces a man to make music as a complement to rhythmic labor. Now, I could wander further down these pathways crossing the great boundary that divides live from recorded music through to the creepy world of Muzak, which is, uh, there are lots of books on Muzak these days, um, through to the pervasiveness of recorded music in the industrialized world, Humvees and war zones, factories, construction sites, taxi cabs, auto repair shops, dentists' offices, where I recently encountered music while he's being drilled. As much of this constitutes passive, I would say pretty much all of it constitutes a passive perception of music, detached from those bodily movements which were so crucial to Bucher's analysis, existing more to distract and pacify than to energize, though in cases like Muzak, Muzak very much corralled to the gospel of high productivity. But I'd rather end with Bucher, not in terms of his influence, but in terms of another kind of resonance, that of this academic expression of broader trends that brought work and rhythmic music powerfully together. Not in the way Bucher wrote about, but at the same time, equally an expression of the toils of laboring. Sadly, Bucher cannot be regarded as a reliable witness when it comes to understanding the actual role of music in the lives of modern workers. Um, and so and that's what I am going to talk to you a little bit, just you know, to end this this little adventure in music and work. In part, I think this is because not writing a lot about what music actually was doing in the lives of workers in this time. I, my theory about this is that he spent too much time in his study. Um, his wife attests to this in many letters to her relatives. He, she says he came out only occasionally when she literally dragged him to the orchestra or the, to the theater. This is the interior of the Vantage Orchestra. Um, you should bear in mind when thinking about this that he lived in the city which had perhaps the best orchestra in the world, one of the best orchestras in the world. During the period when he was living there, the conductors of it were called Reinecke, Art Nikisch, Furt Wengler, Bruno Walter. Um, didn't seem to seize his imagination at all. Uh, what little he writes about his own experience of music, so this is exactly not the milieu that Neville was talking about with ethnomusicology. Um, he's there, but he's not hearing it. What he writes about his experience of music indicates enduring childhood memories, 
of hearing farm workers singing as they worked, or hurdy-gurdy players uh, in the village square. He also makes passing references to how we moderns feel the stirrings of our rhythmic nature when we hear a lively military march or a jolly dance tune. All the more of an omission, then, that he never wrote about what I would consider to be the premier example of music accompanying work um, in this period. Well, there's all three here staying at home. Occasionally happens to something on his veranda. Um, the premier example of music company work in this pre-war period, and that's the phenomenon of military and workplace brass bands and men's choral groups. Naturally, they do not leap to one's mind when considering Bucher's call for not to give up on the hope that it could be possible to bring together technology and art into a higher rhythmic community, which would once give us this sense of fleeting cheer and the body a sense of harmonious formation. But maybe they should come to mind when we think of this. Because indeed, that is precisely what factory and mining bands and singing groups were all about, bringing some fleeting cheer into the lives of workers. And all these kinds of organizations expanded in number and ambition in the decades before 1914, especially in Germany and Great Britain. In the case of Germany, researchers have found that both bands and singing groups were overwhelmingly founded by the workers themselves. They were not imposed upon them. Um, by the masters of the factories and mines. They understood them to be an arena of relaxation, autonomy, and the strengthening of bonds of comradeship. All things that Bucher very much approved of in his writings and, and um, wrote about. It is also not at all surprising to discover that folks leader in groups like this, this is a, you know, this is a mining band. That they were, uh, many of these were in the Saarland and, um, and the Ruhrgebieten song. It's not at all surprising to find that the men's singing groups that developed in this period, too, um, a major part of their repertoire were work songs, folk theater. Um, often, also, they had learned their trade, um, especially the brass bands being in, in military bands. Um, and Richard does acknowledge fleetingly once um, that military bands may be one of the main examples that we can see in the modern industrialized world of music accompanying work and helping to make work uh, less tedious. So, even if Bücher ignored all these bandsmen and singers, we need not. For they, like Bücher in his own eccentric way, or those professors, Weber, Helmholtz, Zimmel, and Strumpf, who took deep pleasure in performing and listening to classical music, attest to a pervasive presence of music in everyday life. And this, in the end, is what our bite in Rhythmus is all about. Thank you.